a student, can, is the mic good? I'm a student of core theosophy, H.P. Blavatsky and her teachers, but I've also been studying non-duality or Advaita Vedanta, doing a weekly satsang for maybe 15, the past 15 years. So this evening, I'd like to look into reincarnation from, my, from both my odd theosophical and the non-dual Advaita Vedanta perspectives. I do not intend to answer questions, but rather I intend to present questions or ideas that perhaps we have not yet chosen to look at. Of course, we'll have questions and answers at the end. So the big question is, for me, for hopefully for you, who reincarnates? Well, I do, of course. Doesn't John reincarnate? The singular John? My personality? And I just don't remember any of my past lives? I think this is a pretty common assumption. But this is a fundamentally egocentric view. The idea that the you or I that comes back must be the you or I that left. Or is it some sort of higher self or maybe a soul that reincarnates? Am I more than just this physical body? Am I made up of different parts? Who am I? There was a teacher of non-duality, Advaita Vedanta, named Ramana Maharshi. Nanyar, who am I, was the mantra that he gave to his devotees. He told his visitors, to consistently and constantly ask yourself, who am I? Are we singular? Am I just John? St. Paul wrote about man being threefold in nature, body, soul, and spirit. He wrote in 1 Thessalonians, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. Theosophy teaches about a sevenfold nature of man and of the universe, similar to the Vedantin system. This teaching then gives us a framework to help answer the question, who am I? Among the Mahatma letters, held at the British Library, there's a remarkable document known as the Cosmological Notes. In it, Mr. A.P. Sinnott and Mr. A.O. Hume are instructed on the sevenfold nature of man. In this document, we find a table in which the numbered principles of man are laid out with terms or labels in Tibetan, Sanskrit, and English. There's a second table in the cosmological notes for the principles of the universe, similar to this, but I'm not going to show that tonight. The masters tell us that everything in, is sevenfold in nature. And by the way, please don't try and read this, the chicken scratches and the uh, Mr. Sinnott's poor handwriting. I'm going to show a, a more legible version here in just a second. But also I'm going to change the terminology that we use. The terminology has changed many times, even during HPB's lifetime. So this sevenfold nature has developed, or at least the labels that we assign to the different levels has changed. So when I put them up, some people some students may disagree with what I'm putting up there. This document describes a range of principles in an ascending order, a range from lowest to highest, 
a polarity from bottom to top. The first or lowest principle is the body, the physical body, the human body. And the seventh or highest principle at the bottom is labeled, interestingly, Mahatma. We call it Atma usually, but it's interesting, it's called Mahatma here. You could visualize this polarity as a line indicating the seven principles. And here I've reversed Sinnott's order, putting the highest principle at the top. As each principle is an emanation from the principle above. Each principle is the vehicle for the one above. Theosophy divides these principles into two groups. An upper triad called the reincarnating ego, Atma Buddhi Manas. Sometimes Atma Buddhi is called the monad. And a lower perishable quaternary, quaternary, get my pronunciation right, the physical body, the astral body or the etheric double, the life force or prana, and the desire body or kama rupa. I like to think of the lower quaternary as bottom up. From the point of view of the personality, the lower kama manas or animal mind or animal soul being influenced by our desire and our instinct that is our animal nature. This is where we find our mind, our sense of I am John, I am this body. We mostly operate out of this lower animal nature, self-centered. But hopefully we aspire to the higher. According to this theosophical model, the bottom half of our constitution, including its personality and its memory, does not reincarnate. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The upper triad, then, I see is top down. Manas, the higher self, the human soul, is influenced, inspired by buddhi and atma, atma buddhi, the monad. It is this upper triad, theosophy teaches us, that reincarnates. HPB calls the upper triad the eternal pilgrim. So when Ramana Maharshi asks us or tells us to ask ourselves, who am I? we are to ask ourselves, am I this body? Am I these cells? Then see if you can find yourself in your body. Am I in here? Out here? Am I here behind my eyes looking out? Ask yourself, Am I my personality? Am I John? Am I my story? We all have a story. We tell ourselves our story. We tell different stories to different people. You tell your boss one story. You tell your wife a different story. You tell your kids a different story. And the nice young lady that you meet at the cocktail party, you don't tell her that you were a bedwetter until you were seven years old. <laughs> so we pick and choose our story. Is that who we are? We tell ourselves, yeah, that's who we are. 
have you thought these answers through when you ask yourself, who am I? Mind is going to immediately respond, your lower mind. But it's going to give you the answer it thinks you or it wants to hear, the one, the, the story that you've been telling yourself all along. Years ago, I was taught a management technique in Japan. Ask why five times. First time you ask why, they're going to tell you what they think you want to hear. And that's what your mind is going to do when you ask yourself, who am I? Question and re-question every answer the mind gives you five times. The Advaita teacher Nisargadatta Maharaj said, don't rely on your mind for, rebel, uh, for liberation. It is the mind that brought you into bondage. Go beyond it altogether. So in doing this, in asking ourselves, who am I, and rejecting the answers and, and re-asking, we're peeling away the layers of the onion. And we're looking, hoping to find a self in, in here somewhere. But finally, we, the only answers we can get are, I'm not the body. I'm not my story. I'm not my personality. I'm not my thoughts. Not this. Not that. Neti neti. You cannot answer this question with a positive answer, intellectually, conceptually. The question, who am I, has no answer from the mind. It will give up, finally, if we're lucky. Of course, Ramana Maharshi knew this. That's why he used this mantra. But mind isn't nearly as smart as we like to think it is. I have another favorite way of looking at this polarity that I want to share with you. I want you to imagine a circle. A circle has a single center, correct? How many points are there on the circumference of that circle? Anybody? There's an infinite number of points on the circumference of that circle. In this illustration, the infinite number of points each represent individual men and women, butterflies, automobiles, solar systems, beautiful flowers, every cell in your body. And I think there's 50 trillion of them, and I don't know, what do we get, 7.4 billion people on the planet, plus every atom in, in the whole planet. Everyone is a point on the circumference of that circle. Now, we could draw a radius from each of those infinite number of points from the circumference to the center. This is our line with its seven principles. Every object in the manifested universe is sevenfold in nature. Each is a radius of that circle. The singular center of our circle is the divine principle, Atman. This circle illusion is best described by a Dutch theosophist named J.J. Van de Leo. In his book, The Conquest of Illusion, he writes, and you have this handout, follow along. Every human being, every created thing is as a ray going forth from the center of the eternal circle to its circumference. In the center, whence it issues forth, it is one with all other rays and realizes itself to be the whole. It is all things. It is the absolute. Where it touches the circumference, it is but one of many, and instead of realizing itself as the absolute, it gains, gazes upon the world of multiplicity, the world of relativity, where problems arise since the unity of life is lost. Thus, in ourselves, we are the great mystery, absolute and relative simultaneously. When we look within, P 
piercing through our own consciousness, we can realize ultimate reality and cease being ourselves by being that, which is all things. On the other hand, when we feel ourselves only as the separate ray, we are surrounded by the multitude of other created things and subject to the illusion of separateness, bringing with it the externalizing of our world image and its objectivation as an independent reality. Our consciousness has, as it were, two windows, one through which we gaze on our own world image and behold multiplicity in the world of the relative, and another through which we emerge into the world of the real, where we cease to be the relative and are the absolute. These two apparently contradictory facts form the paradox in the unity of our human nature. In ourselves takes place that mystery which cannot be accomplished by other means, the quadrature of the circle. In us, the eternal becomes time, the absolute, the relative. Note that Vandaleo refers to the center of our circle as the absolute. In the theosophical teachings, the absolute is beyond Atman, Paramatman, formless versus form, Arupa versus Rupa, unmanifested versus manifested. In her Theosophical Glossary, HPB calls Paramatman the supreme soul of the universe, perhaps the Maha Atma in Sinnott's Table of the Sevenfold Nature. So you see, I'm going to change my label here to Paramatman as the center of our circle, to reflect Vandaleo's thinking, to reflect my thinking. <coughs> Nasargadatta Maharaj said, most importantly, one must know that the body is not one's identity. Maya is a covering that has come over the true nature of Paramatman, the absolute. First comes consciousness, and then the body is known through it. To feel that the body, to feel that we are the body is Maya. That this itself is delusion. And note here that Nisargadatta didn't say that the body is illusion. He says, to feel that we are the body is maya. Our identification with the body is the illusion. In the Upanishads, it's often stated, Atman is Brahman. Or perhaps we could say, Paramatman is Parabrahman. This implies that the one center of our circle is both the seventh principle of man and the seventh principle of the universe, the seventh principle of anything you can imagine. The seventh principle of every point on the circumference of our circle. In, our, in her Theosophical Glossary, HPB calls Parabrahman beyond Brahma, literally. The supreme, infinite Brahma, absolute. The attribute Less, the secondless reality, the impersonal and nameless universal principle, a unity where all things are one, one thing, not one as opposed to two, not one in many, but just the one. As stated in the first fundamental proposition of the proem of the sacred doctrine, an omnipresent, eternal, boundless, and immutable principle upon which all speculation is impossible, since it transcends the power of human conception and could only be dwarfed by any human expression or similitude. It is beyond the range and reach of thought. 
in the words of the Manjukya, unthinkable and unspeakable. HPB also wrote, the seventh is not a human, but a universal principle in which man participates. But so does equally every physical and subjective atom, and also every blade of grass and everything that lives or is in space, whether it is sensible of it or not. The microcosm is the macrocosm. I remember a saying that man is a creature with his feet on the earth and his head in the heavens. The points of the circumference of our circle represent men and women as mundane, separate individuals, feet on the earth. The center of the circle represents the divine principle in man, Paramatman, head in the heavens. Man is the entire radius. It's the entire polarity simultaneously. This is the paradox that Vandaleo was talking about. HPB wrote, and I think this is in the handout, there is but one self in all the infinite universe, and what we men call self is but the illusionary reflection of the one self in the heaving waters of earth. This one self is the Adam Kadman of the Kabbalah. This is the archetypal man, the ideal man. This is the singular universal oversoul of the third fundamental proposition in the, in the proem. That is the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul. The latter being itself an aspect of the unknown root. HPB writes in the voice of the silence, These, this earth disciple is the hall of sorrow wherein are set along the path of dire probations, traps to ensnare thy ego by the delusion called great heresy. And here she footnotes, Atavada, the heresy of the belief in soul, or rather in the separateness of self from the one universal infinite self. She goes on, if through the hall of wisdom thou wouldst reach the veil of bliss, disciple, close fast thy senses against the great dire heresy of separateness that weans thee from the rest. There are no separate others, just the one universal infinite self. Ramana Maharshi said, the subsiding of the mind means the idea of the multiplicity of objects vanishes and the idea of oneness of objects appears. When that is achieved, everything appears natural. By the way, you could put the tree of life on that radius just as easily. And that's a topic for another day. One other thing I want us to look at here are the concepts of time and space. Out here on the circumference, we seem to exist immersed in time and space. Things are here and there, separate. These separate things change over time. Eventually, they perish. Effect follows cause. Cause always precedes effect. From this observation, we conceptualize time. But at the center, in the absolute, time and space do not exist. There is only here and now. Unchanging, eternal, singular, all that is that. According to non-duality, this is who and what you are. They would say all else, all time and space is maya, 
illusion, a mirage. Now perhaps this belief or notion that we are separate objects in time and space becomes more apparent and convincing to us as we move outward towards, move our identification from the center to the circumference. And then becomes less apparent and convincing if we can move our identification from the circumference to the center. Who am I? Vedanta says that man's deepest core or substance within is unconditioned by any description, and that unconditioned substance is called paramatma, or self, capital S. Paramatman is what a man is. Ego is what he appears to be. Paramatman is never born nor dies. Ego comes into being through ignorance or avidya and dies when knowledge dawns in a person. The Advaitis call this death realization or enlightenment. Nasargadatta Maharaj said, I was never born. I will never die. From the Mandukya Upanishad, no individual being whatsoever takes birth. It has no source of birth. This Brahman is that highest truth where nothing whatsoever takes birth. Krishna tells Arjuna, he is not born, nor doth he die nor having been Sethus, Sethus, Seth F, he am any more to be unborn, perpetual, eternal, and ancient. The idea that I was born is a notion, a concept, not even a memory. Anybody here remember their birth? It's our story. There is only, one, only now. No lives in the future. But what about here in the middle, in between? Are time and space the same in here as it is as we experience it out here? Or is it here and now? Or is it something in between? Something like dog years, perhaps. Here is what HPB calls the reincarnating ego. It's off the center. It's Atma Buddhi Manas, the reincarnating ego. So it's kind of halfway between the absolute and our day to day life. So, Vandaleo's paradox. Am I all that is, or am I a separate individual? Am I one of many, or just one, or both? So who am I, and who reincarnates? If at the center I am all that is, as Advaita says, eternal, unchanging, singular, how can I possibly reincarnate? When do I reincarnate if there is no past or future? How can karma act if there is no past or future? How can I change and grow if I am already eternally perfect? There's a very odd passage in Matthew 548. The theologians uh, struggle with this one. Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven, which is in heaven, is perfect. Non dual teachers don't typically talk about reincarnation. Although in India, where their people that come to see them are constantly asking about reincarnation, it's a common notion. They would instead tell you to be who you truly are now. 
You cannot know who or what you are. You can only be who you are now. You cannot help but be who you are now. Not tomorrow or next year. Not next incarnation. Now. If I am all that is, if there are no others, if there is no past or future, who and where and when is my next incarnation? Or all my reincarnations? I submit I am your reincarnation. You are my reincarnation. We are all each other's reincarnation. We are each other. Living all these lives. Your karma, my karma. One thing. The eternal man, the eternal pilgrim. We are the animals. We are the plants on your table. We are the sparrows joining us for dinner every night. We are the python. I'd like to take a break here for a second. I'd like all, it's been a long day. Uh, we're full of food now. Would you please all stand up at your seat? If you can't, that's fine. Feet together. Now, imagine that you are standing on the South Pole. And I hope you brought your parka and your mucklucks because it's very, very cold on the South Pole. Which way is east? No. Anywhere you look, each way you look is north. There is no east. There is no west. There is no south. There's nowhere to go. Now, I'd like you to, in place, with your right foot, take a half a step and put it in front of the other. Don't move. Now, there is an east to your right. There's a west. South is behind you. You've just moved from the absolute into the world of multiplicity, of time and space and reincarnation. But where's your other foot? Still on the South Pole. Where are you? Who am I? Now imagine our paradox. You are both on the South Pole and a half step north. Simultaneously. Nisargadatta Maharaj says, the world and our sense of being rise together and vanish together in the absolute. That, per, that effort or that motion of taking that first half step, as does our, set, our idea of separateness. Just as they do each morning when you wake up and how it disappears again as you take your half step back when you fall asleep at night. Where do you go? Where does the world go? And you can all sit back down now. Thank you for your... I want to close with a short video. Now this isn't from the Theosophical teachings, but uh, it illustrates a bunch of the points that I've made just now, and also a couple others. I think you'll... I think it's fascinating. It's a short story written by a fellow named Andy Weir. It's called The Egg. It became quite popular when it was first published on the internet back in 2009. Some of you may have heard this or seen it, and it's on your handout, the second handout. You were on your way home when you died. It was a car accident. Nothing particularly remarkable, but fatal nonetheless. 
It was a painless death. The medics tried their best to save you, but to no avail. Your body was so utterly shattered, you were better off, trust me. And that's when you met me. What happened? Where am I? You died, I said, matter-of-factly. No point in mincing words. There was... there was a truck, and it was skidding. Yes. I... I died. Yes. But don't feel bad about it. Everyone dies. We looked around. There was nothing, miss. Just you and me. What is this place? Is this the afterlife? More or less. Are you God? Yes, I'm God. My kids? My wife? What about them? Will they be all right? That's what I like to see, I said. You just died and your main concern is for your family. That's good stuff right there. You looked at me with fascination. To you, I didn't look like God. I just looked like some man or possibly a woman. Some vague authority figure, maybe. Don't worry, I said. They'll be fine. Your kids will remember you as perfect in every way. They didn't have time to grow contemptuous of you. Your wife will cry on the outside, but will be secretly relieved. To be fair, your marriage was falling apart. If it's any consolation, she'll feel very guilty for feeling relieved. Oh, so what happens now? Do I go to heaven or hell or something? Neither. You'll be reincarnated. Ah. So the Hindus were right. All religions are right in their own way. Walk with me. You followed along as we strode through the void. Where are we going? Nowhere in particular. It's just nice to walk while we talk. So, what's the point then? When I get reborn, I'll just be a blank slate, right? A baby. So, all my experiences and everything, everything I did in this life, won't matter. Not so. You have within you all the knowledge and experiences of all your past lives. You just don't remember them right now. I stopped walking and took you by the shoulders. Your soul is more magnificent, beautiful and gigantic than you can possibly imagine. A human mind can only contain a tiny fraction of what you are. It's like sticking your finger in a glass of water to see if it's hot or cold. You put a tiny part of yourself into the vessel, and when you bring it back out, you've gained all the experiences it had. You've been in a human for the last 48 years, so you haven't stretched out yet and felt the rest of your immense consciousness. If we hung out here for long enough, you'd start remembering everything. But there's no point to doing that between each life. How many times have I been reincarnated then? Oh, lots. Lots and lots. And into lots of different lives. This time around, you'll be a Chinese peasant girl in 540 AD. Wait. What? You're sending me back in time? Well, I guess technically. Time as you know it only exists in your universe. Things are different where I come from. Where... where you come from? Oh, sure. I come from somewhere, somewhere else, and there are others like me. I know you'll want to know what it's like there, but honestly, you wouldn't understand. Oh, you said, a little let down. But wait, if I get reincarnated to other places in time, I could have interacted with myself at some point. Sure, happens all the time. And with both lives only aware of their own lifespan, you don't even know it's happening. So, what's the point of it all? I looked you in the eye. The meaning of life, the reason I made this whole universe, is for you to mature. You mean mankind, 
you want us to mature? No, just you. I made this whole universe for you. With each new life, you grow and mature and become a larger and greater intellect. Just me? What about everyone else? There is no one else. In this universe, there's just you and me. You stared blankly at me. But all the people on Earth, all you, different incarnations of you. Wait, I'm everyone. Now you're getting it. I'm every human being who ever lived. Or who will ever live, yes. I'm Abraham Lincoln. And you're John Wilkes Booth too. I'm Hitler, you said, appalled. And you're the millions he killed. I'm Jesus. And you're everyone who followed him. You fell silent. Every time you victimized someone, you were victimizing yourself. Every act of kindness you've done, you've done to yourself. Every happy and sad moment ever experienced by any human was or will be experienced by you. You thought for a long time. Why? Why do all this? Because someday you will become like me. Because that's what you are. You're one of my kind. You're my child. Wow, you said incredulous. You mean, I'm a god? No, not yet. You're a fetus. You're still growing. Once you've lived every human life throughout all time, you will have grown enough to be born. So the whole universe, it's just an egg, I answered. Now it's time for you to move on to your next life. And I sent you on your way. Sargadatta said, there is only one dreamer, the one self, dreaming many dreams. In every body, there is a dream, but the dreamer is the same. The one self, which reflects itself in each body as I am. Thank you very much.